Hey, what's up guys? This is Jonathan Lampel with Blender HD, and in this video, we're going to be taking another look at Pixar's RenderMan running inside of Blender. So we're going to talk about interactive rendering and also the Pixar Disney shader. I was going to do a little bit more with this next tutorial going forward. However, I ran into a few roadblocks because the plugin itself is quite new and it's still in development. There are a few things that don't work quite right, so we're just going to start out with these two things today. I've been talking a little bit with the developer, Brian Savory. He's doing a fantastic job with this add-on. It's integrated really well into Blender, so if you see him in the comments or something like that, just say thanks and tell him that he's doing a good job. So uh, in this video, first of all, we're going to be talking about the interactive rendering. You can get that from the UV image editor. So just go there and press start interactive rendering. And if you've installed RenderMan correctly, like we did in the last video, what's going to happen is the image tool is just going to pop up and it'll start rendering your scene. Now it'll take a second and you won't be able to do anything inside of Blender until it gets going. But while it's doing that, let's just talk about the image tool really quick. So it's going to pop up and one thing you want to make sure is that you go to window and window always on top. That way when you have Blender selected, it's not going to go into the background and you'll always be able to see it. Another thing that you have to be careful of since this is a beta, uh, you're going to have to stop interactive rendering by pressing this button here before canceling the render job there. Otherwise, if you do this first, close out of uh, the image tool, and then stop interactive rendering, what's going to happen is Blender's going to crash. So if you do that accidentally, you're still going to be able to save your Blender file before you stop the interactive rendering. So it's not a huge deal, but just be aware that that happens and don't lose any of your work that way. So. Again, that's just because this is still in early development uh, and you can definitely excuse little things like that. So here we have the Pixar Disney BXDF and that's going to be the sort of uber shader that you can use for most common objects. So this is going to be different from the LM, which is going to be your layered materials that you can place on top of one of another. This is going to be a separate shader that you just use this one and it's meant to be as intuitive as possible. So it's not completely physically based, but it's designed to be used as easily as possible with as few inputs as possible while still having a lot of flexibility. Let's go over really quick. So base color, we covered that in the last video, pretty simple. It's just going to be the base diffuse color of this object. And you can see that even when we turn this all the way to black, we still have some of these nice highlights and stuff. And that's going to do with the specular. Now. That base color can be changed with an input socket here with textures and things like that. But I had a little bit of trouble with textures, so I won't be going over that now. And I'll cover it later uh, once either I figure it out or it gets uh, fixed. But just be aware that if you are plugging in textures, you're not going to use UV coordinates or you will be using UVs, but they're called manifolds. So just plug your UV layer name into the manifold option and that's going to be your UV layer. So there we have the base color. Let's just make this a, let's say, dark green, just so we can see everything else very clearly. Uh, we have an emit color down here. And you can see that if we turn this all the way to white, it's going to emit a white light. But since this is sort of a shader where everything is fixed so that it'll render fast, it's not completely physically based. So there's no actual light being emitted like you would have in cycles. To do that, you would need to plug in an area light or something like that into the light output here but in terms of the bxdf it's not actually emitting any light and just sort of faking the effect but that can still definitely be handy for light bulbs and stuff like that we also have a subsurface option here and if we turn that up and say give this a light green subsurface color so if i just turn that all the way on you can see that it's not a real subsurface effect because it's not actually scattering the rays inside of this object However, if you, you know, say, give it a 0.5 subsurface, it's still faking the effect pretty well, and it'll do just fine for things like plastics and, you know, small toys or things that would have a little bit of subsurface, but it's not really that big of a deal that it's, it's faked. So this is mostly for hard objects, is what this is intended for. So anything that's, you know, paper thin or very soft, you may want to use the LM layered shaders. So I'll turn that off. Next we have metallic, and this is sort of equivalent to your glossy in cycles. So if we turn this up, you can see that we now have these reflections. But one thing to note is that when you're using metallic, since this 
going from dielectric to metallic properties is going to tint this reflection inside of the shader. So it's going to tint it more as it's facing you and tint it less as you know it's not facing you based on the Fresnel. But that's how the metallic works. And it's also governed by this roughness here. So if you turn it down to zero, you can have these nice reflections and you can see the Fresnel effect happening around the edges and it's looking quite good. So we can turn that off or turn that all the way up. We also have a specular. So that's just like the Blender internal main reflection highlight. So if we turn that all the way up, you can see that we do start to have some of these reflections in there, which is pretty cool. And we can also have a specular tint to sort of fake that metallic effect. However, you can see that it is very different in terms of how the light reacts with this. So it's not a full reflection, but you're still getting that tint inside of there. And this can be handy for maybe stained objects. So I'll turn that off. Uh, roughness is pretty self-explanatory, just how reflective that material is. So that's simulating all of the tiny little bumps as light interacts with it and scatters around instead of bouncing straight back. So there we have down here, we have the anisotropic. So that's pretty much the same as it would be in cycles where it's using the normals of the object to guide the reflection. You can't really tell too much here, maybe around these edges here and right up there where the reflection is kind of going straight along like you would look at at the bottom of a pan or something like that where it has a definite direction that the light is being spread across. And so you can turn that on or off. Now the second thing down here is sheen. And what that does is it sort of flattens out the object a little bit based on the angle that you're looking at it. So let me just turn the specular off. We can zoom in here and turn up the sheen. Okay, so you can't tell a huge difference, but I'll put a link to the documentation down below and you can see a picture of exactly what it does. But basically it's intended for cloth and things like that, where the direction that you're looking at it is pretty important. And so it's going to give it that nice soft cloth effect, like, you know, like a pile of blankets or something. It's not necessarily going to have those highlights and it's going to sort of spread out over the entire surface. So you can also tint that sort of secondary reflection spreading with the sheen tint. So that's just the same as the specular tint, but it's applying that to the sheen itself. We also have this clear coat, and this is pretty cool if you have objects next to this. So even if you have a, say a specular that's a little bit rough, so maybe you can't see any direct reflections, you can add a clear coat and something, an object next to this is going to be able to be reflected really easily. So you can also see that in the documentation below as well. And you can have a second glossiness for that. So this is really cool, especially for things like hardwood floors, where the light sort of spreads across it underneath, but then that stained layer on top is going to have a nice sharp reflection. And so you can get both of those in one. So that's really cool. And also we have the bump normal that you can plug in a texture for and a presence, which is a sort of a weird word for it, but it's basically a one or a zero and it's a mask in a sense. These are the main things that you're going to need to know. So this is going to be used for objects that are pretty solid and sturdy, and it's just going to be your all around shader for very quickly setting up plausible materials, but not physically possible materials. So again, make sure that you stop the interactive rendering and then cancel your job before doing anything else. And then you can save out your image here or render out right here. So thanks for watching this video. I'll have more coming in the future as, you know, I sort of figure things out and the add-on progresses. And again, definitely thanks to Brian Savory for putting this together. See you in the next one.